So I'm uh, Maud Deves and uh, today's lecture will be about the new challenges of natural disaster risk reduction in the Anthropocene. A natural disaster is a disaster linked to what we call the natural hazards. There are many types of hazards uh, linked to the force elements. Uh, fire, water, air, and earth. Natural disasters actually occur quite frequently. Since the beginning of this year, there have been far too much natural disasters. Here you have some uh, examples with pictures. You have the Dixie Fire, upper left, uh, in California in July. More than uh, 26,000 people were evacuated. Uh, four hundreds of kilometers square burnt. Many buildings were destroyed. One person died and many firefighters were injured. Hurricane Haida on the upper right, it was in August this year. Uh, you see it as it enters the Gulf of Mexico. It killed 95 person in the US. And it was the 60th costliest hurricane in the US uh, with 50 billion US dollars of uh, economic losses. And at the bottom you have the deadly European floods. During this summer, too, at least 165 uh, uh, di uh, people died in Germany, more than 30 in Belgium, and insurance losses have been estimated to 5 to 6.5 billion euros. Other examples, sadly, uh, the ICN earthquake on the 14th of August that killed more than 2,000 people, injured 10,000 of people. According to the UN, IT will need more than 100 million uh, US dollars of aid to be able to start recovery. And the risk we felt there was endured by another disaster, uh, heavy, intense rains that uh, came with a uh, tropical depression called Grace, just two days after the earthquake uh, stroke. On the upper right, we have the extreme heat wave in Canada and the US uh, during this summer. Again, about 1,000 dead. And at the, bottom, at the bottom of the slide, you have two volcanic eruptions. So one that is uh, currently ongoing uh, in La Palma on the left, with more than uh, 60,000 people evacuated yet. And um, on the right, you have bottom right, you have the eruption from uh, the Soufrière of Saint Vincent in the Caribbean that um, was uh, that forced uh, 16,000 people to be evacuated, and is estimated to cost uh, about 30% uh, of the GDP of that island country. Over the last 20 years, uh, we count more than 7,348 disaster events that were recorded worldwide and uh, uh, that you can access into uh, an international database that uh, uh, take uh, count of these events, which is the uh, EMDAT here. In total, uh, disasters claimed approximately 1.23 million of lives, which is an average of 60,000 people who died from natural disaster per year. And it affected the total of more than 4 billion people, and many, one of them on more than one occasion. Additionally, disasters led to approximately f um, 3 trillion of US dollars in economic losses worldwide. You also see on these figures that the numbers represent an increase in, of recorded disasters by comparison with the preceding 20 years. And if part of this increase can indeed be explained by um, better recording and reporting of these events, uh, not all of this increase can be explained such a way. The increase in the number of events can also be attributed to the, an increase in the number of weather and climate related events such as floods and storms and you see it clearly on this figure. Between 2000 and, 2000 and, um, and 2019 there were more than 5,000 deaths and almost 4 million people affected by these weather and climate related disasters which is much more than during the 20 years before. What we see on this figure again is that the number of people affected by disasters, including injuries and disruption of livelihood, especially in agriculture, and the associated economic damage are growing uh, 
But this is in contrast with the relative stagnation and even some years relative decrease in the mortality due to these same natural disasters. Natural disasters are not evenly distributed worldwide. They do not affect everyone as often or as heavily. Some countries are more affected than uh, others, and these may vary from year to year depending on the um, phenomenon we are uh, talking about. So I have given you some uh, first figures and trends about what natural disasters make to us. Um, this is to, to show you uh, that this topic is important to consider, to be addressed, and should not be forgotten with respect to other disaster types. Now, I'll teach you how you can go further into the interpretation of these numbers and trends. And I'll try to show you how the topic of natural disaster is actually connected to the more general topic of environmental challenges, and they should be taken into account when we reflect on how we want to live on Earth uh, tomorrow. So today's agenda uh, will be structured in three parts. In the first part, I will introduce you to the risk, the classical risk approach um, to natural disasters. In the second part, I will um, will come back on a case study, which is uh, to me very typical of what a natural disaster can be in the Anthropocene. And this is the case of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And in the third part, uh, I'll discuss the new challenges of disaster risk reduction in the Anthropocene. So I'll begin with some definition. According to the UN terminology, a disaster is a serious disruption of the functioning of a community and a society at any scale due to hazardous events interacting with condition of exposure vulnerability and capacity leading to one or more of the following, human, material, economic, and environmental losses and impacts. Events we call disasters are, in most cases, events that test or exceed the capacity of a community or society to cope using its own resources. They may, they often, therefore, require the assistance from external sources, which could include neighboring jurisdictions or uh, other nations. Experts go further into distinguishing between small scale, large scale, frequent and frequent, slow onset, sudden onset disasters, but I won't go into detail uh, today. What I, insist for, um, what I insist on is for you to remember to not confuse disaster and emergency because the mass media tend to cover only the emergency phase of disaster but disaster impact actually lasts much longer and it can last for years to tens of years when we talk about about a disaster it's because the event has already occurred before the event to occur, when there is only a threat, we talk about disaster risk. According to the UN terminology, disaster risk is the potential loss of life, injury or destroyed or damaged assets, which could occur to a system, society or a community in a specific period of time, determined probabilistically as a function of hazards, exposure, vulnerability and capacity. It's important there to consider the social and economic context in which a disaster risk may occur. It's notably important to keep in mind that people do not necessarily share the same perception of risk. And you are kind of familiar with that, with the COVID pandemics. Disaster risk comprises different types of potential losses, which, can, which are often difficult to assess. Nevertheless, with the knowledge of the prevailing hazards and the patterns of population and socioeconomic development, disaster risk can be assessed and mapped, at least broadly. And this is the idea of the world risk approach to be able to help decision makers to define strategies to mitigate the risk, adapt to the risk and lessen the negative impacts. Here is a graphic illustration of the notion of risk. Uh, 
risk is really the situation of potential damage resulting from the exposure of a vulnerable stake to a source of danger. Risk is then the encounter between three different factors. The hazard, here the falling uh, plant. Exposure, here the man that is uh, in the chat trajectory of the, of the falling plant. And vulnerability, the fact that the man is actually not wearing his helmet. You can see with this drawing uh, the various levels that exist to mitigate the risk. You can act on the hazard itself by preventing the plant to fall. You can build dam to avoid flooding. You can act on the exposure by not putting yourself in a dangerous zone as this man here on the right. And you can act on the vulnerability by protecting yourself if you have to go in a dangerous zone. So I will now come back on all of these factors and explain it to you in more details. So if we call a natural disaster natural, it's because the other that started or catalyzed the disaster was a natural phenomenon. According to the UN terminology, uh, hazards can be defined as a phenomenon that may uh, cause loss of life, injury, and other health impact, property damage, social and economic disruption, or environmental degradation. It exists various classification of what natural hazards are and disasters. Here is an example of a, a UN peril classification and hazard glossary that is still in use. Uh, so what you can see on this picture uh, is that one main event, and I take the example of a volcanic activity here, can be associated with uh, very different types of peril. Volcanic activity, it could be uh, ashes falling, but it could be lava flows, it could be pyroclastic flows, etc. So it's not one uh, natural hazard, but often it's one natural hazard with a variety of phenomenology of time and space possible impact. Hazards may be single, but they also may, may be sequential or combined in their origin and effects. Floods can generate landslides. Volcanic eruption can trigger forest fires or laha. Hurricanes often lead to massive floodings. Each hazard can be characterized by its location, in intensity, or magnitude, frequency, and probability of occurrence. Such an assessment is in many cases a real scientific challenge. It very much depends on our understanding of the underlying processes, geophysical, hydrological, and etc. Uh, and we are not advanced uh, in every territory of the world in the same way. Moreover, and maybe more importantly, none of these hazards are alike, neither in terms of predictability nor in terms of phenomenology. Here you have a few examples. Earthquakes are not predictable and they last just a few seconds. Tsunamis and hurricanes are better, uh, can be anticipated, but not on the same time scale. And uh, in, for each of these events, uh, they were studied by specialized disciplines often from the natural, the natural sciences, and they gave rise to the development of specific techniques, alert systems, and even risk management strategies. One of the challenges today of disaster risk reduction is to be able to go further than this work in silo, and to be able to integrate all of this knowledge that has been built by thinking from the hazard to the risk, and not from the territory that is at risk to the, the, the multiple hazards that he can be uh, facing. Let's come back now on the other factors that build the risk beyond the hazard itself. Not everyone is exposed to the same degree of natural hazards. From this point of view, there are inequalities which are linked to the very functioning of the Earth system itself. As you can see on that map, Atmospheric circulation, tectonic plate boundaries, subduction, subduction zones are not heavenly distributed around the world. But there are also inequalities inherited from our history or cultural and social factors. Poorer people tend to live in more dangerous zones and they tend to be more exposed. <laughs> 
And it's not sufficient to consider only hazards and exposure. You need to add vulnerability in order to really talk about risk. Vulnerability is defined by the UN as the condition determined by physical, social, economic, and environmental factor or processes which increase the, sus the susceptibility sorry, of an individual a community assets or systems to the impact of hazards. And the, fig the figure below shows that for similar type of events, developed countries suffer much less casualties than developing countries except for extreme temperature waves, which is a notable exception. If we now look at the costliest events, we see that, that they occur in countries with the, higher, the highest income. So more dead in poorer countries and more economic losses in richer ones. That's the sad balance of disasters in general. Vulnerability is not just about building uh, parasismic or not to face earthquake. Decades of social sciences have shown that there are many causes that make a society or an individual more sensible to a hazard than another one. Here you have one, one of those models by uh, Blakey et al. that show vulnerability progress from root causes to the left so root causes are limited access to power or structures or dysfunctioning political or economical systems, for instance. So from root causes to dynamic pressure, dynamic pressure are, for instance, uh, the lack of institution, of training, rapid urbanization in some places. And this vulnerability progress from root causes to dynamic pressure to build up into unsafe conditions for people or community who end up living into fragile physical environment within a fragile local economy in a vulnerable society lacking of disaster preparedness. And it is the encounter again between all these human and social factors with the exposure to a given hazard that makes the risk. So to finish, to end up this theoretical part of the, of the lecture, and then we'll go to the case study, I'll try to summarize the risk approach into three slides. This one is about the ti timing and ideal phases of action of disaster risk reduction, and the next one will be a bit more about the philosophy of the approach. There is the idea that once a, a disaster strikes, so here's a, a red star, you enter, you start, you enter a sequence of phases, starting with emergency response first. This one lasts for days to weeks. Uh, it's a phase that is usually very well covered, uh, mediatically speaking. Then you enter a phase of recovery, uh, which corresponds to restoration of basic services and function. It lasts for months, but it can also last for years. Media do not really cover that phase, at least not extensively. Then you enter the phase of reconstruction, when the media have completely deserted the topic, and it can last for, for years to tens of years. The idea during that phase, uh, the theoretical idea at least, the virtuous idea, is that you should take advantage of the destruction of a place to build better, meaning to build in a way that you can prevent or lessen the impact of the next event if it occurs. And before the next disaster, then you are also expected to prepare for emergency management in order to mitigate the impact once the next disaster strikes. So this is the theoretical virtuous cycle or spiral that organizes the field of disaster risk reduction and that is followed by most practitioners. The philosophy of disaster risk reduction now, it works on two feet, risk prevention and crisis management. Here I'll take the example of the French risk reduction doctrine, which heavily structures the way public decisions are taken with respect to disaster risk reduction. The idea is that you should always start with prevention, so to make 
prevention, you can act on hazards and exposure and vulnerability. And if you work well, supposed, supposedly, the threat will disappear. Of course, things have proven to be not that easy. That's why we have civil protection, because in case you can't prevent or manage the risk, so the management, you can act on the same, uh, on the same things, either hazards or exposure or vulnerability. Then if you can't control the threat and it's still active, you will have to manage the, cr the crisis. And it is supposed that uh, um, risk management can prevent the threat and transform a threat into an incident. And it is supposed as well that cr a good crisis management should be able to transform the threat into an incident and not into a disaster. Of course, here again, this is the philosophy of the doctrine, but in practice, it, it's not that, uh, well, things got harder. So to summarize now the, the history of the evolution of the, of the paradigm uh, that uh, build disaster risk reduction field, uh, we started first from hazard. Uh, the initial paradigm focused on, on the hazards and it started from natural sciences. Uh, the disaster at that time was seen as district, a discrete event, partially and temporarily concentrated, that disrupted the community. It gave rise to an approach that was centered on the assessment of adjustment capabilities or capacities, meaning the decision that could be taken to align human activity within the natural constraint to, of the local environment. And people there worked on mitigation strategy, notably. But people soon realized that scientific and technical parades could mitigate, maybe, but not eradicate the threats. And critics of the hazard orthodoxy began in the early 80s with the rise of the concept of vulnerability paradigm that I presented you. And the proclamation that without people and their associated vulnerabilities, there were no, no such things as a natural disaster. Vulnerability became the real root of disasters, partially explaining the degree to which different uh, communities or social groups in society could react differently from a similar event. The vulnerability concept is still in use today. It makes possible to bridge the gap between the natural sciences who were working on the hazard and the human and social uh, sciences who were working on behaviors, decision making, etc. The vulnerability paradigm, so it continues today, but it's now co evolving along with companion concepts such as the concept of resilience that uh, you, sh you should be familiar with. It's a concept that it's more consensual than vulnerability because vulnerability emerged as a critique of the hazard orth orthodoxy. Uh, it's also a concept that is more action oriented, more that uh, aim to integrate and uh, that has been very, very successful with respect to practitioners. And resilience makes possible also to decom decompartmentalize the uh, thinking about disaster risk and to place risk um, in a more global reflection on human development. So to summarize the change of conceptions from initial works on hazards, uh, the severity of a disaster risk is not anymore measured by the magnitude of the physical forces involved, but rather by the magnitude of its societal impacts. This evolution in paradigm has been accompanied by a geopolitical evolution, uh, especially on the international political scene, but also at the national scales. The issues of disasters emerged on the international scene in the 70s and 80s in the wake of the other great environ environmental concerns and uh, with the works, uh, the Meadows reports by the Club of Rome. The interest in disaster risk really took shape, however, with in, the, in the 90s, with the international decade of natural disaster that was launched by the UN in, in the 90s. The first international action plan to be adopted was the Yokohama Action Plan. So it was in 1994. 
And UN member states at that stage proposed to act for a safer world. And the plan built at that time on the concept of vulnerability, preparedness and capacity building. Ten years later, there had been the YOGO framework for, for action, where UN members engaged to act for disaster resilient nations and communities and promoted a strategic and systematic approach to reducing vulnerability and exposure to hazards. And the last one is the Sendai Framework for Action that was adopted uh, in uh, 2015. Uh, it's designed for acting for disaster risk reduction and that's the first time this uh, terminology is used, disaster risk reduction. Uh, and it reiterates uh, uh, states' commitment to prevent the creation of new risk and reduce existing disaster risk. The, those the implementation of measures that prevent and reduce exposure to hazards and vulnerability to disasters, improve preparedness for response and recovery and thereby build resilience. And as such, it reflects well the advances that were made in conceptualizing disaster risk and in introducing that uh, concept of resilience. All right, so that was uh, the, the hard part with a, a little bit of theory and presentation of the concept so that you can now approach a more uh, practical case study. Um, so we talk about uh, Katrina hurricane that uh, hit badly the US in, uh, um, in uh, 25. And I took that example because to me it's really paradigmatic of an anthropogenic disaster. And I show you why. So first, the hazard itself. So the hazard of seven there is a uh, hurricane of, high, of the highest category, category five. On the satellite, it appears as a monster of more than uh, 1,300 kilometers wide in, in diameter. Uh, when he, it enters the Gulf of Mexico. But in a context on the other side, uh, where its trends and its trajectory were anticipated, uh, which, uh, give time, which gives time to people to prepare, for people to prepare. Plus, the population of New Orleans uh, is used to hurricane uh, alerts, and the last evacuation happened just a year ago for Hurricane Ivan. And in the end, the strength of the hurricane decreased and it was estimated to be of category three only as it entered New Orleans. Now I'll show you uh, part of a documentary that maybe some of you know, When the Le Levis Broke by Spike Lee. And just to, sh to, to give you some, um, uh, to allow you to really see what such a disaster can can be. Yep. A dike, a dike, a levee. Alors, hop. Alors, voilà. Okay. Alors, attendez. Hop, just keep here the <laughs> All right. So We'll start uh, when the hurricane has uh, already come into the city. But I really advise you to see the movie, the, the documentary, it's, uh, it's a great one. All right. Ça marche? just got worse and worse and worse. I mean, it was, it was just incredible, the sound. It was like having a freight train in your ear for hours on end, just, 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 it's just almost 
you can't describe it because it's deafening. You can't even hear yourself think after a while. And all I could think of was one word, and I said it out loud. And I remember my daughter looking at me like, "What is? What is she saying?" But all I could say was, "Stabilize." I just wanted the the winds in the house to stop shaking and to stabilize. Oh my God, it's the end of the world. We heard some explosion. Uh, Emma. It's ironic to be in a pl place like this where the greatest tragedy of ever happened in, in Europe and see your own city being flooded. We slept that night and then we decided to make a move to the next morning to the Superdome. We walked to 20th Street, which is my mother's street, to Esplanade Avenue to Claiborne, where, uh, where the Circle Food Store is. There's my mom, which is 85, my daddy, which is 84, Miss Emma. Miss Emma's probably be in her 70s. We had uh, uh, one guy, I can't think of his name right now, he had a, a colostomy bag that needed to be changed. So I had, we had all these people with us going to the Superdome. Originally, uh, the day after the hurricane, I went walking around throughout Metairie and Kenner area. I uh, went around, swam through water. Some of it was eight feet. Some of it, you couldn't touch the bottom. You see the levels at the malls that were, that you knew were more than 20 feet high and the water was higher than that. And I waded through to see if there was anybody around, anybody anywhere, and it's nothing. Hospital here, west of downtown New Orleans. Uh, show you the parking lot of the hospital, give you an idea of how deep the water is. We had some concerned um, employees that want to check on two locations. Okay, what are you looking for? Okay, the first one is the lakefront area. I, I think there's very little doubt lakefront got a lot of water. Yeah, and especially uh, out there in that in that area by Lakefront Airport in the, in the New Orleans east part of the lakefront. Um, from what we've been hearing, uh, a lot of New Orleans East has been inundated. The Heights in, uh, in Avondale. Avondale did fairly well as far as water. had just died down to a reasonable level where it was pretty safe to be out. And I walked over the bridge and there was 10, 15, 20 feet of water everywhere. And you could start to hear the people screaming from their balconies and the rooftops. And we could actually physically see some of them. A helicopter came by. He came in the middle of the complex. I mean, I'm standing there with a, a mop stick with a, a, a towel that I found somewhere, a white towel with SOS and on the back of it, help me please. And I'm waving this thing like I'm going crazy and he looks at me and he does this. 
like get up and ghost, and they left us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They paid. They were going to the white neighborhood. They didn't care about me. They were going somewhere else. I kept on trying to flag them down. With, man, we had lights. Everything trying to stop them people did not come, and they came here the fourth day, and gave me some water. I was in a boat. I was went to hide it. They dropped the boat water so hard they tried to sink my boat. I asked for some water. They gave it to me. Bet you I won't ask for no more. I will say though, in the backdrop of it all. And, and I want to say this, is that I think that there's one agency that we should single out for a job well done, and that's the United States Coast Guard. Uh, they moved in very quickly. They were in there on Tuesday. They did numerous uh, very difficult helicopter and uh, boat rescue operations because the Coast Guard threw out the books. The head of the Coast Guard said, there are no rules here, guys. This is all improvisation now. Let's go. For example, pilots were only supposed to be able to fly like eight hours a day and legally because you have flight fatigue. They said, screw it. Go, go 16 hours. People were going 16 hours. So the Coast Guard, both with their helicopters and then with boats, could not have done more for their resources. I started noticing that I've got neighbors all over the place on their roof because I'm on a second story. I can see. I can see three or four in front of me. I can hear people yelling and screaming in any given direction you want to go to. And it was hot. It was so hot. It was, it was like a 95, 100 degrees in the shade. The wind never blew. And they say that New Orleans has humidity down there, which kind of cools us off. That's bullshit. It was un, it was death heat. Inside the convention center was so stifling hot, people tried to stay outside. Hot as his hell. <laughs> Sorry for that. It's not easy to find the place. As people started dropping people off at the convention center, and then it just spread like word of mouth. And then that area was kind of high and dry as, as it relates to the area around the Superdome. So it was easy for people to get to the convention center. I saw a guy at Convention Center Boulevard who retired from our newspaper, a disabled guy, walks with a cane, had diabetes, sitting there in the hot sun for three days. He was in bad shape. 20, 30,000 people just in the streets. I mean, it, it was everywhere. People were everywhere. No food, no water. I mean, a bad necessity. When we get mad, they won't even bring water. They won't bring food. Where's Stephen? Where's the man? Mother is 83 years old. She's in dire need of her heart medication. There's no medical services here. She's on the floor. She's dying right now. She helped to get her out of here. My mother kept asking me, you know, well, where were we? And I told her, we was at the convention center. She knew it was a lot of people who were around, but she didn't know how many. So I told her, I said, oh, it's a lot of people out there. I said, everybody's trying to evacuate for the hurricane. She said, well, what are they going to do with all these people? I said, well, they're supposed to have buses coming. I said, but I don't see any buses, which I didn't. So with all the noise, that was kind of getting to her, you know. So but when I went, kept trying, trying to tell the policeman what was going on, he told me, he said, uh, look, i tell you what to do. Take all the stuff, and we're going to roll her outside, way down to the end, he said, because that's where the bus is going to be coming. When the bus comes, she'll be the first to load up. So I was checking on her, checking on her. The last time I checked on her, she, she had asked me, uh, was the bus coming yet? I said, no, the bus hasn't came yet. It should be coming any minute now. So I sit back down. I was sitting on the curb. She was in the wheelchair. So after a while, you know, she hadn't said nothing. For about maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It looked like she was asking me questions. It looked like every five minutes, something like that. So I said, well, let me see, you know, uh, could look like she hadn't fell asleep. But she was nodding out, you know, every so often she was nodding out. So I seen her with her head down like she was asleep. So I went to go shake her. She didn't respond, so I shook her again. She didn't respond, and then I said, "Oh Lord, it looked like my mom and died out here." And then you know, I just waited till when daylight came. Then uh, another guy was out there, and he told me, he said, "Man, he said we got to put something over, you know, because I had like a little tower over." He said, "He said wait a minute." He said, uh, "I might have a blanket over here by me." So he went found the, the poncho that we threw it over, you know, and after we threw it over. They had uh, someone that was working at the convention center say that uh, when they when they was dying like that, they was pushing them to the side because they had another body mm -hmm. back there by that doorway. I pushed that anyway. So you have to push her there, you know, to leave her there. So I didn't want to really do it, but, you know, I had to push her out the way, do something, you know. So what I did, I pushed her back there, and I got a piece of paper, put her name on it, my name, my telephone number, and everything, you know, letting them know I was the son to contact me, you know. 
whenever they come because I thought they was going to put her in the, like a, a freezer or something they had back there. You know, the guys said that the liquor was off, the freezer wasn't working, that's why they had them outside. The bus never came? Never came, came four days later. There's no place where anyone that was elderly or sick or handicapped, there was no place to be. Really wasn't no place for anyone to be, any human being. Yeah, it's always a bit hard to continue after that. Um, comments? Did you knew about that disaster? Maybe some of you, yeah? So, some facts, uh, some other facts, um, some numbers. <laughs> uh, so strong winds, but massive floods. Uh, damages related to the wind were actually moderate in the case of Katrina. Flooding is the cause of most of the death and destruction. Hurricane can cause, uh, as you may know, storm surge. So you have uh, an illustration here on this figure. As the depression, the, the depression caused by the hurricane provoke what we call a storm surge, which is ve very much like a tsunami wave. In New Orleans, there is a very developed system, here you see on that figure, of water evacuation with canals and levees or dikes, because it's a marshy land. And the storm surge from the hurricane was increased by the narrowness of the canals. The levees were submerged at 25 uh, points and many of them ruptured in various places. Here are, you see here actually the black triangles are all the places where you had bre uh, breaches into the levees. And New Orleans filled up little by little as the lake Pontchartin here was uh, filling up into the city. So there were in fact two uh, types of peril uh, related to water sudden submergence due to breaches in the levees and the slow rise of water as the city was filling up. Human losses were considerable. Estimates vary from between uh, 900 and almost 2,000 uh, people um, uh, who died. 40% per of the persons who died drowned uh, it was mainly elderly people, people with, re with reduced mobility, children, and people who could not swim, trapped by the, the brutality of the rising waters when the levees uh, ruptured. And 25% only of the deaths were attributed to injuries and trauma due uh, to winds, typically. Almost 50% of the victims were over uh, 75 years old, 53 were men, and 51 were Afro-Americans, which led, with other things, to, a, to a, a controversy that you may have heard about the racial treatment of disaster victims. There were also heavy economic losses, uh, um, $100 billion in direct losses, uh, Direct losses, I mean insurance estimates for the restoration or replacement of dam damaged or destroyed properties. And uh, uh, even more of indirect losses. And that's where we estimate the, the cost of the, to, the cost related to the time that it will take to restore uh, production and services, etc. For inhabitants, losses are reflected in the loss of their house, their, the loss of their jobs, the interruption of basic services and amenities like water, electricity, communication, banks, local shops, schools, hospitals, transportation services, and etc. And employment in the area had been durably affected by the disaster. And here you have a figure that shows the negative um, effect on the employment in, the, in New Orleans. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's uh, yeah because you may have an increase in employment in some sectors such as uh, building sector, but it doesn't apply to all the other sectors because industry can be damaged and cannot work. Uh, you have a lot of sectors in which you actually can't work because uh, there are no. Uh, you need to repair the facilities to be able to restart production. So, Uh, people just sometimes, yes, if the industry or the jobs could not work, like shops, they were completely flooded for months, so they could not uh, have their employees working in the in the shops or things like that. So there is a direct a direct effect of the the hazard, the flooding, uh, and the time it will take. It will take months before the New Orleans actually dried up. And uh, <clears throat> you also have the ind more indirect effect uh, around that. And the positive effect of a disaster that is often discussed, which is the effect on the uh, building, building sectors, uh, it, it has not counterbalanced the negative effects on employment. And there are, uh, mid and there, are, there are mid term and also longer term impacts. Um, that are often harder to quantify, and that can mean years and years of difficulties at the scale of individuals. So I didn't show you the, the next part of the documentary, but I, I, I encourage you to see it. Uh, the people were, uh, in, the, in the emergency, people were sent by the first plane somewhere elsewhere than New Orleans, um, everywhere in the United States. So people uh, just, like that, with nothing on them, um, ended up in, in cities where they had never been before or where they didn't know anyone. So here you have a map of the, the Katrina's diaspora, meaning all the people who, uh, who were evacuated from the city. And it's only a partial view because it corresponds to the view of the victims who asked for insurance or for help by the FEMA, which is the emergency agency. Uh, that helps them to get some money and to get uh, um, eventually a, a temporary housing for them. So it's about, on this map, it's about a million and uh, uh, 36, uh, 1 million and 36 people uh, who requested for assistance uh, uh, to FEMA and who were um, evacuated everywhere in the, in the US. One year later, only 20% of the city was functional in response to your question, 20% of the city one year later because of the floods. And the remaining 80% of the city was populated by mainly empty houses. Only a third of the New Orleans inhabitants had returned uh, to the city. And 10 years later, and there you start to see the time that it's uh, on the longer term that you can evaluate or assess the impacts of a disaster, Ten years later, only 53% of the adults had returned to New Orleans and le less than a third in their original neighborhood. 40% of them moved to Texas and the rest in Louisiana and elsewhere in the US. And these figures show you that um, uh, the long-lasting trend of the disaster uh, of Katrina on New Orleans demography. The decision to return has been shown to depend on age, on income, and also on the degree of the damage to the house. And younger adults tend to migrate and to stay where they were evacuated more than the, the people uh, who were older and more than the people who were born in New Orleans who tend to return um, more than the other ones. There were also less visible effects, but possibly uh, very painful ones. Katrina had a durable effect on mental health. These figures show that uh, the prevalence of mental disorders is higher than normal um, in the, a year after the, the event. And uh, there are several other studies that show that even 10 years after the event, you can still feel its effect uh, within some social groups, and especially women and children. So, the question we want to address now, and uh, which is very much uh, linked with the idea of Anthropocene, is why such a disaster in a country where no one would have expected it? 
and uh, see this title. When New Orleans went from developed world to the third world, it were, it, it were actually the human ingredients that made the soup for the disaster. A pretty high intensity hazard, yes, but not that much. We saw that it was only category three when it entered the city. But this hazard encountered what? Pre-existing vulnerabilities, poor risk management, and the lack of preparedness for emergency management. So I'll come back on these three factors. New Orleans is located at a strategic location with respect to trade, at the end of the Mississippi River Basin, and as stated by President Thomas Jefferson, New Orleans will always be, as it is today, a mighty market of goods brought by many thousands of rivers, unless some accident in human affairs prevent it. With Boston, Baltimore, New York and Philadelphia on, on her left, Mexico on her, on her right, Havana in front and the immense valley of Mississippi at her back, there never existed a more strategic location for the accumulation and perpetuation of wealth and power. The river drains a huge watershed, the wealth is historically concentrated around the upper valley of the river, but all of it transits through New Orleans to reach the sea. So a strategic location, by any means, but, but, as written by a well-known American uh, writer, in southern Louisiana, you cannot create a city or even a cluster of modest dwellings without declaring war on nature. Hurricanes are very present in the history of the area. Between uh, 1717 and 1915, uh, and, and historical accounts tell of seven hurricanes that hit the city. One cannot say that being hit by a hurricane such as Katrina was a surprise. Betsy in 1965, Camille in 1969, demonstrated the human and urban vulnerability of the US Gulf Coast. Hurricane Andrew in 1992 devastated Florida and caused damage as far away as Louisiana. In 1998, Hurricane George showed the flaws of the evacuation plans and just a year before Katrina, the evacuation order advice for Hurricane Ivan ended up in a fiasco with academic papers urging authorities to prepare better for the next major event. So the risk could not be ignored and because it, manifest, it manifested itself uh, since many years. So a recurrent hazard Zeus, in a changing natural environment the Mississippi River carries enormous quantities of sediments that accumulate and reach the sea, building what we uh, call a river delta. But river deltas are not steady. Uh, let me start that one. River deltas are not steady environments. They are living ones. Rivers change their course a long time, and there is a constant fight against the erosion process coming from the sea. So you see New Orleans here. In the case of the Mississippi Delta, more than 100 kilometers have been gained on the sea by alluvion fans since the Neolithic era, but it's mostly marshy land. To domesticate this such environment, thousands of kilometers of channels and levees were built all along the Mississippi course. Moreover, as many delta do, uh, this one experienced a natural subsidence phenomena under the weight of the sediments. Such subsidence is linked to the compaction of the sedimentary layers, but this su subsidence is aggravated by human activities. The drilling for oil and gas exploitation, the channeling of the river and uh, uh, its damming, which deprive the delta of its natural supply in sediments and accelerate the subsidence, and the draining of the marshes and the draining of the spongy soils, 
um, that accelerates the subsidence phenomenon too. It uh, results in an extremely rapid subsidence from uh, 2010 to 2013. The equivalent of one soccer field of land surface was lost every hour uh, along the coast. So humans settled in a pretty changing zone uh, that they made change even more rapidly. The city of New Orleans developed in a very constrained space. You can see on this topographic and maybe I should say bathymetric map that the city is made of balls below sea level and ridges above sea level. Not all of New Orleans is below sea level. The dynamics of the river has actually built several natural levees and the first settlements, the French Quarter for instance, were built on the natural levees and they were therefore above sea level and protected from flooding. But pe and pe people really tried at the beginning to follow the high topographic elevation to provide uh, accurate prote protection from flooding. But with the development of pumping and drainage technology, the city started to expand itself well beyond the natural levees of the river. And uh, the trouble with levees is that if they prevent seasonal flooding by the river or storm surges, they also prevent the evacuation of the water entering the city. Uh, the water must be constantly pumped out of the bowls of the city for people to be able to live within the city. Levees are also very fragile because they rest on a substrate of fine sediments uh, which makes them kind of unstable. As for the drainage uh, channels uh, that were built, they intended to return excess water to the lake, but in the case of Katrina, they allowed the water to flow within, in the other direction, within the city, and they facilitated the entering of the storm surge at the core of uh, uh, New Orleans city. The proper functioning of these facilities also requires maintenance and uh, inclusion in a broader risk management plan. And the change in environmental constraint due to subsidence and accelerated subsidence uh, should I have led normally uh, to raising the level of the levees. However, in the case of Louisiana, building codes and urban development plans had not changed their provision since the 70s. So several factors uh, combined to lead to the systematic underestimation or even we can say denial of the danger there. The benefits that were derived from the development of new neighborhoods by the lake largely offset the cost of draining the marshes. And there were a false sense of security due to the presence of the levees that led to the progressive abandonment of prevention construction rule. And the major floods caused by Betsy in um, 1965 did not slow down the densification of the urban space. At the time of Katrina, the National Flood Insurance Program that was set up at the, after Betsy assumed that the levees would uh, hold and did not take into account subsidence phenomena. 40% of home insurance policies did not include a specific flood clause, and the master plan for land use did not mention any major risk related to flooding. The European protection system that uh, was uh, started after Betsy was not fully completed, and in any case, it was unsatisfactory due to financial limits and uh, an underestimation of risk. So Katrina was a disaster to be expected, and uh, it was also a foretold disaster. Here is a citation from an academic paper that was published a year before Katrina, after Ivan evacuation fiasco. And the author warned, uh, should a Katrina-like disaster become a reality, it will undoubtedly be one of the greatest disasters, if not the greatest, to hit the United States with estimated cost exceeding $100 billion. According to the American Red Cross, such an event could be even more devastating than a major earthquake in California. Survivors would have to endure conditions never before experienced in a North American disaster. <laughs> 
and then they list all the adversary factors that are increasing the risk of such a disaster. So the loss of coastal marshes that dampen storm surges, river levying and marsh excavation activities that threaten the marsh integrity, and sea level rise that further accelerates that loss. Katrina gave the impression to the whole world and to the Americans first that the, first, the third world had invited itself in the United States, as they say. Nobody expected to see such scenes in a Western country and even less in the first economic power in the world. Beyond the lack of risk prevention and management, there were also many troubles with the emergency management itself. The failures of the chain of command in emergency had been uh, uh, published by the US Congress after Katrina, and the list is very long. I will just give you some uh, hint into it. Preventive evacuation order went too late. Uh, it was only uh, 19 hours before the impact. 80% of the population could leave because it was recommended 30 hours before, but 20% of the people stayed. The requisitioning of private transportation for the evacuation of patients in hospitals of, uh, to evacuate people without cars did not work. There was a poor antip anticipation of the number of people who were likely to take refuge in the Superdome and the Convention Center. We were two places where people could go if they were vulnerable and they could not uh, get out of the city. Uh, but the stadium uh, could accommodate 10,000 people for a few hours uh, while the hurricane was passing, but not 45,000 people during five days. Sick people died in hospital without electricity. Prisoners were taken out of cells and left on highway ramps. Food and basic necessities were lacking, and the very high heat uh, increased the Indiana problem. People trapped in attics died of exhaustion with no help. And the re rescued people joined the desperate people of the city center and piled up in the sun on the highway ramps. There were no provisions for them. And all of that also because of the rumors uh, that, were, um, that, that, that were spreading, uh, that uh, it was a, a situation of chaos and violence within the city and mayors of the neighboring uh, parishes blocked the bridges uh, because they didn't want refugees to get into their, um, their, their parishes. So authorities at all levels were underprepared to face the disaster. Lack of human and material resources. On the eve of Katrina, there were not enough national guards uh, mobilized and they were not deployed to intervene into uh, New Orleans. And the condition of interventions were very difficult, uh, dirty water, electricity cable in the water, and, and etc. So emergency services were overwhelmed by the extent of the task and completely disorganized, except for the, um, the Coast Guard, as they say in the documentary. And the federal state of emergency was only partially declared, and there were controversies uh, about the bureaucracy of who should have declared and what, while people were waiting for rescue within the city. The federal rescue teams finally arrived four days after the, the hurricane hit, and it took them four days to take people out of the city. Hospital emergency plans did not anticipate for such a delay, and people died without electricity and without rescue within the hospital. In addition, the Federal Crisis Emergency Agency, the FEMA, was not ready to face the situation and was strongly criticized for its lack of anticipation and reactivity. In the absence of government communication, the media exacerbate also rumors of violence, delaying the relief effort. So the population was really left on its own and felt endangered. The people who were supposed to protect them were coming to them with weapons to uh, keep order. And this resulted in rumors uh, uh, that were false, but that uh, really complicated the action on the ground. Uh, false rumors actually did lead to violent behavior. Some of the people who, were, um, who did not lose everything armed themselves to try to defend their properties, and they were 
uh, it was dozens of murders uh, on, on victims of the floods who were trying to escape uh, because some uh, uh, some militia, I don't know how to say, were trying to, uh, to protect their properties. The, the authorities' choice to maintain order um, at all costs was strongly and heavily criticized after that because it was based on unverifiable rumors. Nobody were actually inside the city at that time. And we also know uh, that uh, uh, the social and uh, the human and social science studies have shown since a long time that uh, in disaster time, on the contrary to what is often assumed, people uh, don't behave by panicking, by, by antisocial behavior. On the contrary, people tend to develop pro-social behavior to actually survive together. And we know that the first responders in, situation, in disaster times are actually the neighbors and the families and the friends that are around that actually help people. <laughs> That's all for Katrina, but I think it, it shows you the, how human ingredients there have uh, contributed to build up the disaster and how the hazards can be just a starter or catalyzer of the disaster, but in many cases, it's nothing more than that. There are uh, sadly many other examples. So I talked about, about the US, but in France, we, we also have our Kat Katrina. Uh, it was in uh, 2010 and it's a Xintia storm. So Xintia storm made a lot less um, death, but still, it's the deadliest event in France in the storm of uh, 1999. Uh, it made uh, 47 um, deaths, uh, 41 were due to su marine submersion, and it, it costed uh, bit around 2.5 2, 2 billion euros of uh, economic loss. Again, here, uh, meteorologically speaking, Cynthia was not a great storm, not the greatest storm we knew, but it, it happened in conjunction with the uh, high waters and uh, uh, the places that were hit, badly hit, uh, were very uh, vulnerable to marine submersion. A bit like in the Katrina case, huh? you see that the the place uh, actually inherited exposure and vulnerabilities from the past. Uh, a recurrent flooding phenomenon that led to successive creation of levees. And uh, as here uh, a geographer uh, say, the risk was implicitly known since the urbanization was done in part in inverse relation to the, to, to the danger. The safety plots, the highest and less humid, were urbanized first, then progr progressively again the lower, the lower plots. None of the people who died in La Faute sur Mer on February 28 lived in a house built before 1950. And you can compare that map with the map of flooding here. And you see that all the green parts correspond to the uh, successive levees that were built to um, dry the land. And you see that the water has came back at the same places. And so the question is, uh, levees that expose rather than protect? Levees were built first to protect agricultural land and not uh, places where people were living. But from the 70s, the decline of the agricultural sector and the development of tourism led to significant and unregulated urbanization, sheltered, sheltered by the levees from the 70s. The levees were poorly maintained, again, like in um, New Orleans, because of fragmented responsibilities. And you have is here a figure that really shows the evolution of the urbanization of this area. And in red here, you have the uh, red zones where you are really exposed to high risk. The victims of Katrina were uh, generally people over, uh, over 60 years old. 
some with reduced mobility, surprised in their sleep. The age of the victim is also high because of a difference in exposure to the risk. Indeed, the people present in February in these uh, affected areas uh, were usually retired, they were in secondary houses. The attractiveness of the coastline uh, leads to an influx of people who settle in secondary houses. This introduces a specific vulnerability uh, sli slightly less than 20% of the population of this uh, commune of La Faute sur Mer was not previously in this area uh, before. Between uh, 1940 and uh, 2010, La Faute sur Mer, was, uh, was, which was only a fishing village, became a town of more than uh, 1,500 inhabitants in winter and 7,000 in summer. So the new, the new arrival have uh, also no memory of past events. And uh, you see that uh, there is a combination of a lack of awareness of the risk, a lack of information and protection measures, and also single story house, so houses that were not built to take into account that risk, uh, that contributed to this such uh, uh, a disaster. Other example in France, uh, as you may know, Paris area is at risk of massive flooding. Um, well, you may have heard about the, the, the great flood in, uh, in 1910. Uh, you see here on these figures the extent of the area that, that, were, that can be flooded, that were flooded in, uh, in, in 1910. And uh, we are still, despite the building of several uh, mitigation uh, structures, uh, on the river before Paris, uh, there is still a high risk of flooding. And just to give you an idea of that risk, because we are in Paris, uh, so of course it's a place where you have high exposure, it's one of the richest uh, regions in Europe, uh, 11 million inhabitants, 30% of France GDP, 20% of the active population on 2.2% uh, uh, of the metropolitan territory. High human and socio-economic uh, stakes. It's uh, 8, uh, 8 and 30,000 to 8 and 50,000 inhabitants and 435 uh, homes. It's 100 establishments and uh, 700 jobs. And a high vulnerability. Dependence on numerous and highly exposed structural facilities, public services, hospitals, transportation, um, just to provide you with uh, two examples, three incineration plants are located in flood prone areas with potential impact on waste treatment for hundreds of thousands of inhabitants. Another example, several drinking water plants are located in flood prone area with potential impact on the drinking water supply of several millions of inhabitants. And another a factor of vulnerability is a high interconnectivity of modern urban areas like elsewhere, electricity, public transport um, for the movement of population, road transport for logistic, telecommunication, etc. If you have a, an electricity cut, for instance, due to flooding, you uh, also stop a lot of these sectors uh, functioning. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development actually uh, quantified the potential impact of a flood, uh, uh, great flood in Paris, and the consequences are potentially very heavy. They estimate 5 million citizens directly or indirectly affected, uh, 4,000 jobs directly affected, 1.5 million people without electricity, 1.3 million people without drinking water, 30 billion euros of direct damage and significant economic losses at the national level, uh, which would represent five years of impact on the GDP of France, costing up to 50 billion additional euros. And by the way, any flood that would exceed the threshold of 6 620 meter at the Paris Hostel station, uh, which is a decennial flood, uh, would be considerable challenge to manage for the public authorities. And it is well known by practitioners. Uh, so we end up with the last part, uh, and then uh, 
I hope you will have uh, also some questions. The new challenges of disaster risk reduction in the Anthropocene. So you all know about the concept of Anthropocene. There are debates over the starting date of this uh, human transformed era. But the idea is rather to point out here that human activities can be as impactful as some geological forces. And I think I did not actually tell you anything else since the beginning of this uh, lecture. This is demonstrated by climate change, of course, uh, and the anthropogenic contribution of climate change, but also by many other observations, such as this uh, wonderful uh, human-marked views of the Earth from space, <laughs> or the presence of plastics in superficial geological layers. The concept of Anthropocene is stimulating for risk disaster, uh, for risk specialists, uh, as it provides a term that englobes a series of changes that impact directly or indirectly disaster risk reduction fields. The American uh, geographer Susan Cutter point, uh, points out three main changes that must be taken into account by us. The first one, is the fact that extreme events become much more frequent, uh, if not chronic. But there is also an evidence uh, that a singularly large extreme event, although very impactful in proximate space and time, is far less consequential in the longer term than less extreme but chronic events on places. The second change to take into account is the fact that there are much more complex interactions today between natural, technical and human systems. And cascading events are becoming the norm rather than the exception with consequences well beyond the immediate area or time frame. Third, there are always greater inequalities Inequalities are increasing and in some instances accelerating beyond the capacity of places to cope with disaster in, and risk exposure. All the three components of the risk are affected by such changes. Hazards, change of nature, and one <clears throat> now has to deal with the impact of urbanization on soil sta stability, impact of climate change on erosion, sedimentation, sea level rise, permafrost melt, temperature extreme, extreme events, or in another field, we also have to deal with induced seismicity. <coughs> On the side of vulnerability, more complex systems means more difficult systems to study, to monitor, and to protect. And on the side of exposure, one has to take into account the increase of the world population and the settlement of the most vulnerable in areas uh, that are at risk. So let me provide some examples. Extreme events uh, are often defined as uh, such if the strength of the hazard exceeds a certain statistical threshold. And I think you have seen Hervé Le Treut, so that's typically the kind of thing he, he, he may have said. According to this definition, extreme hydrometeorological events are increasing and no longer follow the usual statistic due to climate change. Intense rainfall, uh, heat waves, forest fire, floods, landslides will become more frequent events. And in some places, they could even become chronic. Uh, 20 of the most destructive fires in California occurred, for instance, in the last 20 years. But defining extreme events on the basis of uh, statistical or physical threshold is a bit re restrictive, though, because consequences can be extreme even for hazard that is not, and that's what we, we saw. As we saw before, disasters are increasingly extreme because of their human and economical impacts that are increasing. Example of Katrina in the US, example of Xintia in France, and strictly speaking, those are not extreme events in terms of natural forces at play. Uh, but they are extreme in their consequences because people and places that are affected are particularly vulnerable. But still, you see, so you see on these figures, what I wanted you to see is the augmentation of the frequency of, this, uh, of some of these uh, uh, phenomena. And what we see is that in some cases, we can pass from 
uh, frequency of, of one per uh, century to one per year. Just to give you an idea that on some phenomenon and in some places, you really can go from infrequent to chronic events, which uh, raises uh, huge challenges for, uh, to, to manage the risk. So the second point was cascading hazards. Um, well, cascading hazards increase human insecurity. Some ca ca cascading events, uh, such as here, the well-known Tohoku earthquake followed by a tsunami, followed by Fukushima reactor meltdown. Uh, they, they, they showed that they can have uh, um, a potential to disrupt uh, regional, uh, national, and but also global economies. Uh, the, 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 the interconnectivity of system of production and consumption today increase human insecurity in, in, uh, in places that are subject to many disasters and cascading events. As shown uh, uh, some decades ago by Ulrich Beck, the, the sociologist, human societies are partly responsible for constructing such cascading risk. Uh, as shown by Beck, uh, uh, we produce some of this risk by installing some industrial facilities, technological facilities in places where you can have uh, hazards. And if events are not cascading, they can simply be coincident and yet still hard to manage. Evacuation for the, from the eruption of the uh, Soufrière of St. Vincent uh, um, in April uh, this year was complicated by the pandemics. It was kind of hard to put people in temporary housing places where they could actually follow distancing the um, uh, measures of social distancing. So uh, you, you see that you also have to think about the hazards that can be coincident if n even not they are not uh, uh, following each other. Uh, the, third, uh, the third point was inequalities. Here you have a, a figure that, that shows well uh, such inequalities. Social inequalities ba uh, based on the intersection of race, class, gender, and age, influences the creation of vulnerability and the impact of disasters. It has long been shown now that poor people are more vulnerable and more exposed uh, because they are the ones who uh, can buy or who can live in the houses that are uh, the most exposed. If uh, in the uh, Paris area you want to buy a house for a, a cheap price, uh, you go in the flood prone areas. And women and children suffer heavier consequences uh, also. And this has been shown in uh, uh, many places and in many cases. The last point that I would like to add <laughs> uh, is that one, to emphasize the interaction of scales between local, regional, and global. You see that today local events quickly become global in their impact. Um, medias play actually a big, quite, quite, a, quite a role in, um, in, uh, in moving this, uh, these local events to global ones. And uh, one can show, and we did a, a study there with, uh, uh, with our team, on the um, homogeneity of the media coverage of some of these events that uh, provide a certain way of seeing uh, certain events that can also be misleading in the way we think about um, uh, facts. Some of the big challenges of uh, disaster risk reduction today, and there are probably many others, but uh, today people work on densely populated urban areas, on coastal areas, on the management of more frequent events and with extreme consequences, on the management of coincident or subsequent crises, of systemic crises, Multi-risk prevention is an issue, the management and, uh, uh, of uh, multiple risks at the same time, multi-risk alert systems, increasing inequalities. Also, and uh, we didn't talk much about it, but the disconnection between people and political decision making that makes quite kind of difficult to uh, develop and apply uh, disaster risk reduction strategies. People miss information also before, during and after a crisis. So that's my last slide, and I, then it's, uh, it's to you. 
to address all of these challenges, uh, today we need uh, to think a bit differently from what we did before. We must think about the interaction between natural and human systems rather than natural system on one side with the natural sciences and human system on the other side uh, with the human sciences. But this is not that easy to do. We are trying to do it in uh, at the Centre des Politiques de la Terre, but uh, it's kind of a challenge to be able to do that because you need to transcend traditional academic boundaries. Uh, and it's not easy. In France, for instance, the academic system is a kind of uh, well structured with these traditional uh, disciplines. You also need to develop monitoring tools and protocols that allow studying more complex hybrid systems and to study the systemic effect, which is kind of hard. You also need to work within but also outside the academic world and be able to really work hand in hand with practitioners. And to think a, a step further, get research results to enlighten decision making and actions and not just uh, do research for doing research, which is already great, but uh, I, I think it's important to go a little further sometimes. Thank you.